Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Welcome to EIG's 73rd webinar, a fireside chat discussion with our guest experts from the industry, Danny Kaplan from SMC Data and Greg Schlegel from the Supply Chain Risk Management Consortium. We are looking forward to an interactive discussion today with each and every one of you, and we hope that your, uh, you and your family are healthy and safe. Uh, we appreciate you taking the time to join us for this interactive fireside chat. We encourage you to enter into the chat box as we're dis make, having discussions on these topics. It's, uh, this webinar is uh, really for you. Uh, just a little background, uh, you know, EIG believes that it's all about people, process, data, and technology that can solve your fulfillment problems, improve cash flow, enhance customer experience, and increase revenue. There's, for our discussion, we'll demonstrate not only uh, how you can get better, but how ERP implementations do not need to be disruptive. And Danny will wrap us up at the end of the webinar for that. Again, we look forward to an interactive webinar throughout. Uh, we we like to laugh a lot, so hopefully you enjoy this uh, uh, cartoon. We believe we're at that tipping point of rising inflation and diminishing re, uh, demand. We do see a slight uh, leveling off of inflation, but with that, we'll expect to see a diminishing demand. And we wanna hear what you're doing about that. And we have some best practices to share with you. Uh, my name is Jim DeVries, founder and president of Enhance International Group. Uh, we're exchange of passionate experts to guide your transformation to help generate self-generating and self-funding results. We have over 50 consultants, consulting companies, and SaaS providers that have been vetted to be best in class. We EIG serves as the master integrator, uh, acting as a swift army knife. And our team is dedicated to empowering your organization's workforce by leveraging EIG's partner tenure thought leadership expertise. Our goal is to meet and exceed your expectations with self-funding 90-day action plan programs. Uh, our past webinars are free and can all be found on the uh, consultingeig.com. We have over 70 uh, webinars up there for you to check out. Uh, today, we're fortunate to have with us uh, two highly respected leaders in the field, Danny Kaplan and Greg Schlegel. Uh, Greg, uh, uh, Danny established SMC Data in 2014. He has extensive experience at IBM, as Greg does. And um, Danny, a few words of introduction. Um, welcome, everybody. My background is computer consulting. What I will present today is the supply chain ERP, integrated software that enables company to deal with today's reality of excess inventory and uh, get the resulting cash flow issue. Thanks, Danny. And Greg? You bet. Let's Thanks, go. Jim. Go ahead. Well, welcome, everyone. I'm the founder of Supply Chain Risk Management Consortium. We've been in business for... 12 years. We'll talk a little bit more about the consortium in a second, of which uh, Jim and EIG is a member. I've taught supply chain risk management at Lehigh University here in Pennsylvania for about 10 years. I still teach ERM, Enterprise Risk Management, at Villanova University near Philadelphia as well. Spent eight years with IBM as a supply chain uh, executive consultant. Spent 30 years, perhaps like many of you, as a supply chain practitioner and executive. Uh, and I've taught supply chain management at six different universities uh, in my career and ended up with uh, being uh, president of the Apex organization now called ASCM. So great to be with you uh, and back to you, Jim. Thanks, Greg. And with that, uh, we're gonna have a uh... Danny, give a little background of SMC Data. Danny? That's the company I represent, VII. They are $45 million company, 200 employees. And it's single database software that has a manufacturer distribution of food that enable a manufacturer to be a distributor and a distributor be a manufacturer. And uh, 
it's one-stop shopping, has analytic, which 360, give 360 degrees visibility of what's going in the company. Thanks, Danny. And Greg? You bet. Said we'd give you a quick profile of who we are and what we do. On the right-hand side, uh, you can see who we are. Uh, we're uh, about 31 companies, I believe. We're still growing. That's about 1,700 supply chain risk professionals around the globe. These companies bring tools, techniques, methodologies, and solutions to help us identify, assess, mitigate, and manage supply chain risks. That's all we do. What do we provide? On the left-hand side, we've got five areas of products and services. We provide two online certification courses, one basic in supply chain risk and resiliency, and one dedicated to public health care. Uh, we coach and consult companies in their SCRNR journey. We bring enterprise solutions that essentially do heavy lifting for supply chain risk and resiliency. Then we have two online assessment tools. One we're going to talk about today, that is supply chain management online readiness assessment tool. We'll talk more about that today. And the newest one is a prescriptive online 90-day action plan, evaluating your maturity, your risk maturity, risk appetite, and culture using AI and ML algorithms. So that's who we are and what we do. Uh, back to you, Jim. Thanks, Greg. And just a, a brief background on EIG. EIG is over 50 companies. You'll find the the companies in the back of the deck. Uh, don't want to go through all those, but uh, they are our partners and we're very proud to have them as part of the EIG team and that team keeps growing. And uh, I just want to share a little bit about our approach of strategy and execution. We feel like uh, it's very important to understand that, you know, one strategy or one, one strategic rotation results in many execution. Many companies focus on execution, execution, but if you don't have a strong strategy, you don't really know where you're going. So we have our 50 uh, partners help you on both the strategy wheel and the execution wheel to tie everything together so that you have sound tactics. Uh, and we love the quote of Albert Einstein, Life is like a bicycle to keep your balance. You need to keep moving. So we got to get moving with this webinar. So this is the seventh webinar that we've had in the series of, of webinars. And we look forward to next year continuing this series. Uh, our agenda today is how well are you positioned to weather the storm that's brewing here. You hear it on the news almost every day now. The recession, the R word, as they say, is coming. Uh, best practices in navigating this high inflation and diminishing demand that we're going to, we feel is the tipping point, and we're very close to that right now, and you may be seeing that today. Uh, and then we'll talk about how important it is to have an inter integrated ERP to support you in, in enabling you to, to make critical decision making in a crisis. And if you don't have a system now, there's no time like the present to get one and, and help shore that ERP up and make sure it's delivering what you expect it to. Uh, Danny will share some integration success stories. Uh, his system can be integrated very, very quickly and, and some, best, uh, some benefits of doing that. So ER implement, ERP implementations address economic instability. Yes, we can proactively address the storm if we have good visibility of our transactions and what we're doing. So with that, how well we position to weather the storm, we'll get right into it. Uh, we, we call this the tipping point. We wanna uh, focus on discovering what that tipping point is. And, and with that, we have uh, alternative uh, sourcing and supply chain network design takes into consideration a lot of different things. We have this uh, supply chain risk management, network design, and right sizing. So these three capabilities create the ability to scale and sustainable growth at a predictable cadence in a VUCA world. And when we say VUCA, we're talking about volatility caused by things like COVID lockdowns and, and any, any lockdowns by governments. Uh, 
especially China. Now China's opening up. So easing up that lockdown in China is certainly going to have an impact on the economy. Uncertainty of the root of the of that event, you know, what's causing that and 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 feeling comfortable with that. The complexity of the supply chain. We know that we live in this integrated supply chain. It's very complex. And 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 beauty of what's next, the VUCA world. The risk events are getting more transparent as our capabilities detect and report upon these risks, the events become more visible. Everything from the COVID pandemic to the next variant, labor disputes, work stoppages, cyber threats, and counterfeit. We were just talking earlier, all these things are happening uh, on top of, of what is we have been going on lately. So everything is, is kind of going, uh, we're seeing more and more of this because the transparency and we're able to react sooner. So the companies, the exemplars are certainly reacting in a proactive manner. The big companies you see making some big strides now in uh, unemployment uh, of starting to lay off people in, in, in the angst of what is we call the pandemic or angst of the recession of, of that occurring. So we look at it from a, uh, that we're getting stretched, right, right sizing, uh, you know, we're being stretched with lower demand and goods and network design inflation is, is rising. And so our network uh, is going to have to be stretch, is, is stretching. So stretching our network design in new sourcing locations is, is rising inflation. At this time, we're seeing diminishing demand through this right sizing and we're stretching ourselves at both ends, almost like an accordion, letting out the air can create some beautiful music or some sad music for us. So uh, it's up to you to plan your orchestration. So Greg, Danny, some thoughts about what's going on right now? We have, we're looking at a down, downturn economy. What we had before shortage of inventory, we have not excess inventory because so supply now, there's not the supply is open, vendor delivered the inventory late. And uh, Thanks, Danny. Go ahead. My video did not start, but it's okay. Yeah. Yeah, that's okay. You're on now. Um, we have now people. People habit have changed from going to the shopping malls they buy online, and then re that result in large returns. So the side effect of large returns is cash flow issue. So you have to know what to buy, when to buy, how much to buy, and whom to buy. Late delivery will result in the order being the order being cancelled return to you and extra inventory, which results in a direct result of cash flow issue, which is a heaven for the MA world today, because companies have go out of business and the MA takes over and it's a whole different ball game. Thanks, Danny. Greg, your thoughts? Uh, real quick, the bullwhip effect on steroids is still in business, folks. <laughs> the uh the amplitude between supply and demand and the latency in supply chain is still with us. It's getting better, getting a little more manageable across certain industry sectors, not all. So it's st we're still wrestling with the VUCA and the bullwhip. Thanks, Greg. Excellent comments, guys. Appreciate it. If you have any comments, please do enter them into the chat. Uh, with that, we'll just talk about inflation a bit, the causes of inflation, uh, the demand pool. And on our with our graph here, we have price level and an output. And year zero is today and year one is tomorrow, so to speak. And AS is aggregate supply and AD is aggregate demand. So this uh, came through us uh, through the Corporate Finance Institute. Uh, so we thank them for the help here. But uh, demand pool inflation is all about having too much money, chasing too few goods. If you can uh, uh, relate to that is when there's an increase in aggregate demand, 
and the supply remains constant or decreases. Some of the causes, of course, is a growing economy that consumers feel confident and spend more and take on debt. This increase in demand drives higher prices. It kind of sounds like what we're living. And also it's augmented by another cause could be government spending. Of course, common triggers are geo geopolitical shocks like the Ukraine war, natural disasters, hurricanes, earthquakes, and of course, COVID. So that's the demand pool inflation. Then you also have the cost push or supply side inflation. And as you can see here, you can get rises, uh, price levels going up in this case, going from year zero to year two with a constant uh, demand and increasing um, supply or decreasing supply, I should say. So decreasing supply and what you see here is price levels increasing. And this occurs, and we call this wage push inflation, it occurs when money is transferred from one economic sector to another, and specifically an increase in production costs, raw materials, and wages inevitably is passed on to consumers in the form of higher prices for finished goods. So Greg was just mentioning the bullwhip effect, and this is the result of the bullwhip effect from a financial economic perspective. So... Greg, do you want to follow up with some comments on this? Uh, it's uh, kind of inflation 101, folks. Yeah. Uh, uh, as, uh, as Jim mentioned, uh, uh, inflation uh, and the inflation increase could be a portent, portend uh, diminishing demand. That's our tipping point. So uh, whether it's demand pull or um, or cost push uh, with supply side, the net net is inflation is up there, higher than historically uh, acceptable, I would say, uh, and that's going to potentially diminish some demand across multiple sectors, so. Yeah. Danny, your thoughts? What we are facing now is a very rocky environment of, of supply chain where Cost, we feel it when we go to the supermarket or when we go shopping. What we paid before is doubled now and cash flow become very more scarce now, which create a big strain on companies now. So you need to know what to buy, when to buy, and how much to buy, and how to, and how, and how to manage your inventory flow. Yeah. And I think what happens is because everybody's worried about rising prices, which accelerates this, just to add on to Danny, what he said, is people will buy more than what they need, then they get caught. Because for them to make those goods and then sell them, they can't, there's nobody to buy them or they spoil. So then all of a sudden you end up throwing things away. So that's that excess inventory that we've been talking about for quite a while. So with that, I see a question in the chat box. Which inflation graph would you prefer uh, if you have to have one or the other? Um, <laughs> I think just having one would be good. Uh, I, I think this is where the Fed is very confused because I think because of the bullwhip effect, both of these graphs are active and which is I think is why we're seeing accelerated inflation, but we're, we're oscillating back and forth. And because of that, we're, the Fed doesn't know what to do. So they're raising interest rates to try to abate this. Yep. I would say, uh, I would answer it. It's a, it's a matter of timing. For the first time ever in 45 years of my supply chain career, demand and supply shocks inevitably have come simultaneously. And the latency in supply chain, which is always there between the time you order and the time you receive the goods, that latency has been expanded by all the exogenous uh, risk events. And essentially, the Fed is wrestling with the bullwhip effect and the latency, which they've never seen before because the amplitude has been so big between supply and demand and the yeah. latency so long that the Fed's 
classic approach <laughs> is going to take a good long time because of the uh, dynamic uh, situation. So first time ever, that's yeah. my comment. And, and with the pandemic, there's a lot of bet up cash that people didn't spend. And so there's cash there, government, a lot of bailout money. And so there's more cash on that. So people, you know, where, where is the curb when people can stop spending? And I don't think anybody really knows at this point in time. And, and so they'll keep raising interest rates until inflation curbs. And we could talk about this for more, but let's move on <laughs> with Greg uh, providing some uh, uh, information on the CEO confidence. Yeah, we have one chart here. Uh, Jim, again, uh, attempted to give you a sense of inflation 101. Uh, these are insights from some of the friends of the consortium a company called the conference board here in the U S and essentially it's a CEO confidence level, which they've been doing since 2000. You can see it on the X axis. Uh, and, uh, the Y axis on the left is uh, low confidence to high confidence. Anything over 50 is uh, a tipping point that we're talking about today. And as you can see over on the right hand side, uh, perhaps uh, it could be some rough going in the next couple of quarters in terms of the confidence level based on their 20 some year uh, evaluation and uh, survey questions. So I'll turn it back to Jim. Thanks, Greg. I think we'll just move on. I think this is something just to take into account as we move forward. Uh, again, welcome questions and comments anytime. We have a, a lot of things to share. A lot to talk about. <laughs> Go ahead, Greg, CPI. Uh, again, just another uh, another uh, index year over year that essentially says, uh, shows visually, and most of us take our cues from visualization. It just shows that, uh, you know, the year over year consumer price index is what we're living with right now. Uh, yes, it's dropped a bit, but uh, it's higher historically than uh, than over the last uh, 20 some years. So things Jim. are going up, but we did see uh, a plateau maybe here in September. Uh, and are we, the question is, are we at that uh, precipice yet? And the Fed is still looking at to raise interest rates. The last I heard between 0.5 and 0.75. Now it looks like 0.75 because now they're saying that government spending or, or people spending, I should say, people spending is is very high, and they expect a six percent increase over last year in sales over the holidays, which may mask a lot of this inflation uh, and cause cause inflation to go even higher. So we'll see. Uh, what the Fed does, but they're going to keep raising the rates. Um, the I've, I've shown this graph before, but I think it's, it is pretty important to look at it from uh, total shareholder return for resilient uh, CPG uh, companies. They've outperformed both resilient competitors and the S&P uh, 500 from the 2007. So this is a lesson learned. And we can see that the ones that really got on the ball and, and built resilient enterprises use the basics of supply chain risk management uh, are the ones that are did much better coming out up to 245 basis points better than folks that were not pract uh, practicing these things. So you're going to come out higher if you do use uh, the practices that we espouse. Uh, then, then you will if you do not. So it's just a, another selling point for trying to drive your increase in maturity and supply chain and supply chain risk management, things that we uh, help and espouse uh, with the supply chain risk management consortium. With that, I'm going to turn it back to Greg on end-to-end -end supply chain landscape. Yeah, this is uh, just uh, what we see, folks. Uh, on the street when it comes to end-to-end -to -end supply chain landscape transactions, tactics, operations. So uh, one, increased inflation, 
we feel will diminish demand across many sectors. We've talked about that several times. Again, many sectors are now canceling 2X, 3X, 4X orders, which will produce another imbalance in the supply and demand bullwhip. Also, companies who ordered the 2X, 3X, 4X quantities in anticipation of the bullwhip of the lockdown are now receiving that supply. And that turns into what, folks? Excess inventory, which we will be talking about all day today. And it's good for consumers, bad for retailers. And we say that because there'll be discounts everywhere. And going into 2023, the primary impact, chances are good probability that another six to 9,000 stores across the globe will close in 2023 because discounts basically impact bottom line. And if you can't produce cash in a crisis, cash is king, it's a red line item, uh, you basically don't have a business. Sad, but true. Jim? Thanks. Danny, I'll let you uh, grab onto this one first. What we are facing today is inventory coming in that was canceled prior while the pandemic is expecting it to at, or expecting to to come late. So you bought it from two or three vendors or multiple vendors, and now it's coming late, but the consumer doesn't want it. So you end up with excess inventory. Another factor is the shopping mall. People don't go to the shopping mall now, they buy online. And buying online means you don't know if it fits you, the, the shirt, the pants, or the jacket. So they're a very high return. So we end up with excess inventory, which translates now to cash flow issues. Thanks, Danny. Yeah, and I'm seeing it with my CPG uh, client, and uh, we're that cut, they are can customers are canceling and or delaying orders which uh, then we end up with excess inventory. If you have raw materials that have shelf life on them, you know, you now you have a shelf life issue and or you have too much inventory. So it's, this is real, it's happening today. And uh, uh, make sure that you're looking at canceled orders and the resultant inventory uh, coming from that. I'm gonna just backtrack a bit because uh, there was a question about uh, definition of TSR. I'm just trying to get my computer to respond to me. And the definition of TSR, uh, total shareholder return, I kind of glossed over that, is a measure of financial performance. It indicates the total amount an investor reaps from an investment, specifically equities or sh uh, shares of stock, to arrive at that total of, of TSR. It factors in capital gains and dividends from a stock. It might also include special distributions, stock splits, and warrants. Whatever way it is calculated, TSR means the same thing. The sum total of what a stock has returned to those who invested. So hopefully that clears up the question on TSR that came from our audience. Just want to make sure. Uh, that, uh, so the question, second follow-up TSR, but resilient enterprise, Mark, I'm not following that, uh, resilient enterprise. So the definition, okay, let me read it one more time. How resilient enterprise defined. Oh, those are those companies, resilient enterprises are those companies that, uh, use, um, it's on the right-hand side, actually, the full definition, but they practice resilient enterprise uh, practices like what the uh, supply chain risk management consortium espouses. So these are the ones that they have termed uh, companies. So you'll see that on the, so on the right side. If you want to have more details about how they define that TSR, uh, but I think, Greg, you you ha may have a few thoughts on that, on that article. Yeah, essentially, uh, we, we have a definition of resilient enterprising 
enterprises uh, in our book and what we teach in our classes. And that essentially is uh, any company who can respond proactively to any type of risk event, all right, to essentially mitigate that risk and uh, and keep uh, the uh, keep the bottom line sol uh, solvent and positive uh, in terms of uh, any type of risk event and recover faster than their nearest competitors. So, kind of a uh, it's a little bit of a jumbled up uh, comment, but uh, uh, you know uh, I think uh, if you really want and everyone. Uh, Mark, everyone, every company, including McKinsey, has their own definition of what a resilient enterprise is. That, that's kind of ours, is that if anyone can, a company is resilient. One, if they're still in business in 2022, that's real easy. That's the Wall Street definition on the right-hand side of the first page of the Wall Street Journal. Our definition is if you're in business and if you can recover from any type of risk event faster than your nearest competitor and fulfill your obligations to your stakeholders, your shareholders, and your customers and so forth, uh, that's a resilient enterprise to us. And, and we'll be getting into that in just a few more minutes uh, on some later slides. Uh, we just hit bankruptcies real quickly. That's another indicator. Uh, we saw an uh, increase in bankruptcies around two, 2020. And the question is, uh, are we going to see more in the future? Um, so uh, th what people are saying on the street in simple terms is, yes, we're going to be seeing more. Uh, every All the buzzes that we'll see 16% uh, more in 2022. In the second half, there's going to be a lot more. In 2023, we'll see a 19% increase year over year. You can see the different sectors that are being hit the most in the past, mining, oil and gas, and retail, as we have just discussed, services and manufacturing in the second, in the 2020. So we'll have to see who, what industries are going to get hit. Are those industries going to get hit again with more and more, or are some other industries going to get hit? Uh, that's the million dollar question out there. Uh, but uh, thus far, it, the jury's out on that. Uh, so I think we're just going to keep moving to keep things going here. And the other uh, slide that we have is talking about which CEOs are talking about in Q3. And this chart has starts with low and fading importance on the y-axis and low and growing in importance and this is what they're talking about the, the keyword search growth from iot analytics they do a great job on on analytics and we're we're proud to use their 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 graph that they've developed and on the x-axis you have keyword in importance from uh, 0.1 to 100 percent on a log scale with a midpoint about five percent bottom line is the hot the trot top is in the upper right hand quadrant, which is economic slowdown, recession, hiring, automation, AI, uh, uncertainty and inflation is in this upper right. The things that are falling off that used to be in the upper right are sustainability, supply chain and COVID and the invasion in Ukraine. Uh, on the left, these are the things that have been kind of around for quite a while. Industry 4.0 still up there as a topic, process automation, raw materials, and augmented reality and virtual reality are kind of falling off, or are they going to pop up and be more in their future? So these, you can look at, they could be falling off, or they could also be things that could be more prevalent in the future. You might say hybrid work is, is now when you hear the buzz, less and less people talking about hybrid work. So uh, with that, uh, you know, in summary, you got to focus on your enterprise-wide supply chain maturity, we believe, in order to weather this storm. And because what you don't know about your supply chain can and will hurt you. Any uh, thoughts on that, Greg? Uh, I, th I think it's, uh, it's readily apparent uh, what's driving the bus at the moment, folks. And that's the big blob in the top right, uh, top right uh, quartile, and that is economic slowdown. What 
do we do if demand diminishes and I have excess inventory? And Danny? Supply chain will become a crucial issue now, keeping track on your inventory. You can't overstock because you never know when it, the order will be returned to you. So keeping the balance between what you really need and what for production or for sale and what you order is a very crucial issue. Thanks, Danny. With that, we're gonna keep moving. We got so much to cover, <laughs> probably too much to cover. Greg? Yep, with those, well, think of it this way, folks, with, uh, with the salient economic stats that we've uh, shared with you, we feel this is pretty darn important. That is linking your supply chain maturity to financial performance. So this is basically MBA Finance 401, which we teach. On the right-hand side, in 401, you will learn about quartiles in an industry, leaders, followers, average, laggards. We color code them, all right? The question on the left-hand side is, does it pay to be a leader? We think categorically, yes. All right, so going into 2023, what should you be thinking about? Well, first quartile companies all will be buying other companies. An increase in M&A, we talked about that in a couple of previous um, uh, webinars. So first quartile companies will be buying other companies. Those are in the green. Second quartile companies will be rationalizing their product lines, their services, all right? And they will probably be selling certain divisions and product lines, the yellow. Third quartile companies are going to be bought. They're, they're being eyeballed right now, all right, for either their people, their tools, their techniques, or to take them off the market. And fourth quartile companies, sadly enough, will be going out of business. So essentially, where are you positioned in your industry? We feel going into next year, you need to be painfully aware of where you are. So with that, we'll move on. An opportunity to assess your supply chain process maturity could be utilizing our newest tool, Supply Chain Management Readiness Assessment. It's online. Essentially, it is um, uh, 13 tenants. We've spent 30 years in supply chain and 12 years in the supply chain risk space and, and about 3,000 different exercises from hundreds and thousands of companies, we've developed a, a SEM readiness assessment tool that does two things, folks. It evaluates your supply chain process maturity and inherent risk within those processes. You can see there's 13 tenants in our point of view that makes up end-to-end -end supply chain. You can see we have them color-coded. The blue are strategic, the red are tactical, and the green are essentially operational. The star charts and maturity chart, all right, it evaluates your company's supply chain process maturity, where the lower the number, the more mature the process. As you go through the 90 some questions, you can see a company's response, which is the black line. And remember, the farther away you are from the center of the chart, the the, more, the less mature your processes are and the higher your inherent risk. So it's kind of a twofer. All right. Again, we have the secondary element, the uh, risk associated with it. Those are the green, the orange, and the red circles. And essentially, you can then get a, uh, an assessment of both your maturity and the level of risk. And the beauty is it's free. There's a... Uh, click on a URL on the bottom bottom right. Uh, you can take a look. And uh, if you run into trouble, feel free to give us a buzz, send us an email, and I'll turn it back to June. Thanks, Greg. Uh, please do uh, uh, sign up for that. It's free. Um, and you can also uh, find it on the Supply Chain Risk Management Consortium's website. So we had a survey question at the beginning. Uh, love to hear your feedback here. Uh, you can enter your comments in the chat. Uh, some of the things that uh, we're hearing from you, cancellations, inflation, uh, next, I'm not, a uh, bottlenecks maybe, that was it, uh, costs, 
orders, price reduction, cash, lack of orders, losing customers. Greg, your thoughts? Uh, I wish there were less, folks. I really do. Uh, we're crying with you. Uh, it's, uh, it's not an easy deal right now. The biggest thing right now is cash flow, folks. Remember, cash flow. If you can't produce cash in a crisis, that's a red line item. You got to protect your cash flow. Great. Danny, your thoughts? Cash flow become a very big issue for company now. And you have to really mon monitor it. And the main thing is monitoring your customers. If a customer pays you in 150 days, you better watch it because it might go out of business and you get stuck with the receivable and excess inventory you don't want. Great. Yeah, we can talk about this for, for quite a while. There's there's uh, a lot of things going on, a lot of moving moving uh, moving items in, in your supply chain. So with that, we're going to move on to giving you some best practices in the next section. And um, we're going to start with uh, one of the, I, I would say, one of the key metrics out there that's a leading indicator of whether you're an upturn or a downturn. And that's called the BDI, the Baltic Dry Index. Uh, so just a, a definition here, it's a fundamental at the global economic activity uh, of a technical indicator of freight industry capacity. The BDI tracks between 1000 and 2000, you see here on the upper right. Generally it's in this range here and it typically falls off as recession approaches and leads the recovery out of a recession. As such, it's a useful leading indicator of global economic health. So why is this important? Well, if you own a company and you start seeing it going down, then you can kind of tell that uh, we're probably entering in a recession. If it goes below the, the 1333 line, uh, the 1377 line, that, that number, uh, or even 1,000, 1, then you're really, really worried. You can see in 2020, we went below a thousand. Even going back, you can see the recessions here in the early '90s, the 2007 recession, and uh, our 2020 here. So we're we, we've had a a number of recessions, and this has always been a, a clear indicator. So if people say I didn't see it coming, um, I think there's more visibility into this today than there ever has been before. So we're always looking, is the BDI changing? So this is one best practices, doesn't cost you any money, published every day. They talk about it, that, you know, spend five minutes and, and, and get updated on the BDI, where it's going uh, and the buzz around it. And again, this is measures the cost of shipping of bulk dry goods worldwide on 20 lanes. So that's our underline, underlying uh, materials that drives everything, and and d is the cargo uh, shipping lines how available is that fleet? As we know in the re in the recent years, all the cargo ships are in the wrong place at the wrong time, and it's starting to settle out. But we're still going through some rocky times. With that, I'll turn it over to Greg to share the second best practice. Yep, sir. Uh, this is uh, financial health. We're talking about the tipping point of your suppliers and your customers. On the left-hand side, this comes from McKinsey 2022 report. Uh, they talk about uh, an ugly situation. Organizations likely to go bankrupt over the next two years. The things we've been talking about could be some rough quarters by level of operation. And look what they talk about. They put them and categorize them into quartiles, like we just said, MBA Finance 401. They say, listen, there's a 73% probability of bottom line, bottom quartile companies going out of business over the next two years. Then 48% in the middle and about 30% even in the top quartile. All right, so there's no guarantee. And then on the right side, we are providing you some insight on 
a supplier bankruptcy predictor. Whether you've heard about it or not, it's the <laughs> Altman Z score. All right. It's essentially a bankruptcy predictor with over a 90% forecast accuracy predicting bankruptcy 12 to 15 months into the future. Who wouldn't want to have that data for their key suppliers or even key customers? You can because it's free, folks. All right. And what it does, it goes through all you need is an income. Uh, income sheet and balance, a balance, income statement and balance sheet for the company. There's the algorithm. We can share that. You can find it in Wikipedia and it becomes a heat map. You go through the calculations. You can see the scores down there, green, yellow, red. All right. And we would advocate you do this. It's free. It's a poor man's financial supplier health dashboard. If you, you can find it on Wikipedia, Instapedia, and Investmentopedia, and so forth. Do it because uh, essentially you can start tomorrow if you can get the income and balance sheet data for that particular supplier or customer. There's more. Kind of a call to action. Uh, we'll we'll uh, start on the left side. Just think of it. Real-time supply chain visibility drives value for shippers and providers. Pretty simple. I think that's a fait accompli. All right. Supply chain transparency, you need it to increase productivity. It helps plan and optimize your inventory. Danny's going to talk about that. It improves partner relationships, all good benefits. On the right-hand side, action items, we talked about cash flow. Watch your cash over the next couple quarters. There's something called cash conversion cycle. We don't have time to give you the algorithms. Find it on Wikipedia. You can calculate it for your own company, your suppliers, and your customers. Do it and do it regularly. Improve your planning and replanning agility because time is money going forward, folks. Evaluate your product portfolio. We advocate using something called GMROI. All right. If you're not familiar with it, you can find it on Wikipedia. If you can't, give us a buzz. We'll send you the algorithm. It's a different way of evaluating the profitability over time of your product portfolio. Segment your customers. Remember this. 20% of your customers represent about 80% of your profits and contribution margin. Not all customers are the same. If you're not segmenting your customers, you're leaving money on the table. And finally, accelerate your digitization. We mean in supply chain. Think about digitizing the transactions in your supply chain. Stay close to your customers. Stay close to your key suppliers. Jim. Great. And I'm just going to wrap up real quickly. We did cover this last time, so I'll go real fast. Uh, these are what we call the uh, our seven steps that we came up together came together as a team to develop. One is understand your inventory. So that's trustworthy. Did we know it? Danny will talk more about how to do that with his ERP case studies. Share data amongst internal departments. Make sure you're, you are, are transparent. Uh, leverage your fast moving products. Reduce slow moving parts, just like Greg was just discussing. Your top tier, 80%, 20%. Uh, 80% of your, 20% uh, of your customers drive 80% of your fast moving products. Uh, confirm your demand priority with your customer. Confirm availability of supply. Update your bombs to make sure you're, uh, you keep them up to date and you are finding alternative suppliers and consider vertical integration and internal increased capacity or capabilities. And, you know, leveraging ERP software to minimize shortages and in access inventory is the bottom line. Danny will get into this in a minute and uh, and next, and I'll turn it right over to Danny. Danny? Okay, I need to, you need to start my video. Okay. One, the thing, one of the most important thing is how, how well you are prepared to, to face the future which we don't know what it, will, what it will bring. So a lot of people have outdated ERP software, which they translate to excess inventory and cash flow. 
So you must have, you must have integrated software that has comp all those components you see now that's integrated with each other. A lot of company has satellite of separate software, which means the integration is corrupted and resolve is corrupted data and access user, user. Uh, I'm sorry. And access user uh, efforts to find the data. We had few cases of customer has five, six modules of ERP resulted in corrupted data. Next slide, Jim. This is a dashboard, a 360 view of the entire company, your sale, your inventory, your customer, your customer payments, your, your sales for performance. So the executive and the, and the key people in the people in a bird's eye can look at the entire company and see what it is. Those are graphs that can be that can be tailored to your specific requirements. Integrated software, it's a very important issue. If you have multiple vendors with multiple issues, you run into, to use layman language, is taking one car engine and a second car transmission and try to pull it together. You result in data, in, in corrupted data. And that means your email story out of work. You don't know when to order, how much to order, or you order too much. And by customizing it and trying to put it together, you, you just increase your issue of uh, vulnerability, vulnerability of when the inventory will come in and how much you have in inventory. Next one, Jim, please. That's a case study of a manufacturer. MRP, when having the right material in the right time is very important. Otherwise your production line will come to a standstill. It's a perfect case study in today's environment of China locking up the Colvet and the Ukraine and material coming late. You have to know when it is. And this is a good case study of a company achieved the optimum situation. Next one, Jim. You have to know where, where it is, what's coming, when it will coming, how much will come, and what to order. Customers are very important knowing what, what they need, what they owe you, and how long it will take them to pay. Because, and you cannot allocate all, your, all of your efforts and sell to the big gorillas like Amazon or Walmart and forget about the small customers because if they drop you, it's a JC Penny story and you're out of business. Next. How do you weather the storm? What's the best practice to, to go through it? You have to have integrated software that tells you what's coming in, what's your inventory on, on level, what to order and from whom to order. Knowing from which vendor to own there is a very important issue. If the vendor has slow supply, it is late on his supply, your production will suffer and your order will be canceled, resulting in excess inventory which you face today and cash flow issue, which it's a one-to-one -one issue. That's a case of a food, food distributor who sell produce. Produce have no barcode, or barcode label. They are using a headset by 500 tomatoes, 600, pick up 600 cucumbers, 300 cauliflower, and that's the result they achieve, a million dollars in, two, in over two years. That's another case of a distributor with 100 locations nationwide. Before they used to upla upload the data to the, to the host computer, and if it failed, Headquarters never knew what exactly the inventory in each location. Today it's real time. They know exactly in which location what they have, how much they have. And if one location is overstuck and the other one is overstuck, they use a common carrier. Another thing is they give the contractor the ability to order on the phone. So there is a third shift. In the morning, the package is ready. While the pickup truck, truck is, engine is running, they grab the order and they, and they move away. 
That's another case of a manufacturer that save a hundred thousand dollars in per in per year. It's extremely important today to keep track on your on your ability to lower your cost, which is essential. Otherwise, you run into the issues of joining the club of companies going out of business. Next, Jim. That's a case study of an M&A. This particular client has multiple ERPs and achieved issues with the supply chain and took them days to, to ship it. Today, they have 99.6 accuracy and they'll be able to ship it the same day. And they use a smartphone because they came from outdated software. They saw the RF, RF guns and what the hell is that? $3,000. So for four hundred dollar Android phone, when they achieve this, the inventory, this is a supply. A, this is a case study of a manufacturer worldwide who bought a distributor and ran into the issues of inventory accuracy and data integration, and that's the result today. Seventy five location went live. Next, are you prepared to to face the storm. If you don't have current ERP software, you are joining the club of the department store who are discounting left and right the inventory and having a single database software, that's the result you have now. Imperial debt went from a hundred million to a billion dollar in 10 years by buying companies. Black River is a, is a water distributor and Atom Heart is a manufacturing distributor. And those are case study of return on investments. That's the most important thing what you have to have today. Integrated software, one single database that has it all in one place, rather than have a hodgepodge of six or eight separate ERP, trying to put them together, that doesn't work too well. So Danny, we have a question. Um, how many data systems linked to the VAI ERP system, manual entry or linkage to existing, existing data systems? VAIs have over 3,000 headquarters, which is mean a headquarter can have multiple location. A good example is Sid Harvey that have a hundred location nationwide. Mm -hmm. So it's all in, and there is two to, to, it's all on, on the, the cloud is two hosting, one in New York, one in Virginia. So if we have a Katrina in New York, the, the auxiliary host kicks in in a matter of less than 30 minutes, everybody's back in business. Great. So how are, are is, if you have a external database, can you take that external database and, and and consume it, or do you have that type of capability? I think is what the underlying question is. Are you reliant just on the ERP and what you build there? Basically is in your server, each client is in a separate environment. So there is no data conflict and they use the IBM Z server who is the most secure server in the world. And IBM has, IBM has a team 24 by seven trying to break into it. And with today, with today what's happening with the, with the cybersecurity is a huge issue. Mm -hmm. A good example is when we have Katrina, NYU hospital had a generator in the basement, got flooded and they have to ex lost electricity. That's what VAI has to offer. Okay. The source code can customize to meet your business need. It's not like a square peg in a round hole. You can get unlimited users. If you're a hundred users, you can buy out front. So if tomorrow you do M&A and you're 300 users, you have to pay again. Multiple vendors integration, like the truck industry. And it's for the mid-market companies starting at $30 million and upward. Thanks, Danny. Very interesting. Uh, case studies, uh, really proving the need to move to an enterprise uh, system. And the nice thing about VAI, it doesn't have to be complicated. It can be done at a very low cost and very flexible to help you scale. So thanks so much, Danny.
Uh, with that, uh, this is the conclusion of this webinar. Uh, just uh, as I promised at the beginning, we have over 50 partners. Just want to give them all a raise there, a rise there of all, all the different names in our team that covers people, process, data, and technology. With that, I uh, have some closing comments. Turn it over to Greg first. You bet, Jim. Thanks, everyone. Think of this as a tipping point with rising inflation and a distinct possibility uh, of a downturn. All right. Uh, it's more important than ever to understand your supply chain maturity. So what I would say is improve your weaknesses, leverage your strengths in order to survive and thrive going forward. All the best. Thanks, Greg. And Danny, your closing comments? We live in a tough environment and we have to know what to buy, how much to buy and when to buy. And having integrated software is crucial. Otherwise you run to, to issues of excess inventory and cash flow issue. Thanks, Danny. And my concluding comment is, you know, we need to increase our transparency and ERPs and IoT and data tracking and traceability. Uh, and we need to be tracking levels at the SKU level all the way down to the item level. And we need to have those proactive discussions, those hard discussions with your customers and suppliers uh, to make sure that you don't get too much inventory and you're able to supply what they need. And at bottom line is cash is king. Don't get caught with uh, debt because you don't have the data to prove that you have a, a backlog. So I wanna thank every one of you for joining today's webinar. Thank you so much and have a great day.